Okay, we are live and I'm going to open the room.
Hello to, ev hello to everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, we are going to wait some other minutes to allow all participants to, to join the, this Zoom meeting. Good morning to, to everyone, uh, or good evening, according to the part of the world in which you are. Uh, nice to be uh, with you here. I'm Giuseppe from the steering committee of the Global Student Forum, and I will welcome you in the, in the meeting. Um, first of all, uh, for the ones that are following uh, uh, through the, the Zoom meeting, please uh, uh, take care of uh, selecting the correct language you want to hear uh, this meeting in. Uh, in the close to the to the interpreting or languages uh, down on the um, on the screen of your computer, close to the audio settings and video settings, you should have these. So there are all the channels, and you can select uh, the language you want to hear. And now I will sell, I will say that in the other languages, uh, so people that are in the general uh, channel can also uh, listen to that. Hola a todos, bienvenidos y bienvenidas. Tenemos disponible un servicio de interpretación simultánea que nos permitirá escuchar la reunión en inglés, español, francés y portugués. Para escuchar en el idioma que entienden, seleccionen ese idioma en la pestaña de idiomas. Ahora lo voy a decir en otros idiomas, así que todos puedan oírlo desde la, eh, el canal general donde estoy ahora. Bonjour à tous. Nous disposons d'un service d'interprétation simultanée qui nous permettra d'écouter la réunion en anglais, espagnol, français et portugais. Pour écouter dans la langue souhaitée, veuillez sélectionner cette langue dans l'onglet langue. 
Hola a todos. Tenemos un servicio de interpretación simultánea disponible que nos permitirá huir a reunión en inglés, español, francés y portugués. Para abrir no idioma de su escuela, por favor, se seleccionar ese idioma en la guía idiomas. And now I will do the same. So I will be in the English language channel. So welcome to everyone. Uh, people are still uh, entering the room, but it's nice to start uh, because it's already almost 10 past uh, two here in Europe. Um, welcome to everyone. And first of all, let me uh, say sorry for my pronunciation in other languages. And uh, um, so welcome to everyone uh, to the to this summit. Uh, just a second, because I'm I'm having some. Well, I'm hearing the Spanish. Is it possible? Uh, I hope everyone can hear me in the correct language. There's always a bit of, of fun uh, with these things uh, at the beginning of this kind of big meeting. So thank you for your patience and especially thanks to translators for the great work and interpreters, the great work that they are going to do and they already did in the preparation of this. Um, so uh, I already explained that we have these languages. Um, the, the, the key house rule is please keep the microphone muted while there's the meeting so you can listen clearly to the others and uh, not having interferences or things like that. The event is going to be uh, recorded. Uh, so I also welcome all the people that are following us from, uh, from Facebook. Uh, and so it will be shared, of course, on social media uh, in this live stream and then in the recorded version. Uh, please take care uh, of uh, uh, putting the, the working languages in your username. You can probably already see from my username. Uh, for example, I put that I can speak English and Spanish. And uh, uh, of course, uh, choose, uh, as I said, the, the channel that you prefer. And uh, uh, after these technicalities, uh, I would like to really formally also welcome all of you uh, on behalf of the organizing uh, platforms and organizations that made this event possible. So the Global Student Forum, uh, I'm part of the steering committee and all of my uh, lovely colleagues are here uh, and some of them will moderate and speak uh, and the members uh, of the Global Student Forum. Uh, in particular, the regional platforms, uh, the All Africa Student Union, the Commonwealth Students Association, the European Students Union, the Organizing Bureau of European School Student Unions, uh, and the Organización Continental Latinoamericana y Caribeña de Estudiantes, OCLAI. Then the partners uh, that uh, made the, uh, this event possible, uh, Global Youth Biodiversity Network, uh, Students Organizing for Sustainability International, SOS, Commonwealth Youth Climate Change Network, and the Future Coalition. It's a, it's a great pleasure to, to, to be here with, with all of you uh, and uh, uh, with people from every angle of the world. Um, also, uh, I, I already see that there are some, some questions. Uh, uh, please uh, uh, write uh, everything, uh, any concern you have or any, anything you want to ask, write it in the chat so someone from the team can read it and, and answer to you uh, without impacting the, the flow of the, uh, of the interventions. And, uh, uh, so it's great to, to have here people from every part of the world uh, and uh, uh, because we are talking about a topic that is so sensitive, so important, uh, and that is so global environment. Uh, talking about this, uh, uh, a real priority for us uh, would be to start from something that is a bit, you know, less happy than, uh, than uh, a great student meeting is. Uh, the fact that uh, we would like to introduce a moment of commemoration. We are talking about the most precious thing that we have, our environment and biodiversity. 
the, the, the resources on our planet that do have the power to generate life and sustain development too commonly become objects of greedy competition. Too many people are excluded from resources necessary to survive. Nations go to war to control them and many people die in the attempt to protect nature. We in particular want to think just to mention some about the victims of wars, conflicts and confrontations over water, like on the Jordan River, the Nile and the Tigris and Euphrates. We think about all the people suffering famine and desertification, like in the Horn of Africa, in the Mediterranean Basin and in Central Asia. We think about the effects of biodiversity destruction, people like traditional fishermen and fisherwomen in West Africa and the Gulf of Guinea, whose waters are getting poorer every day for ocean grabbing led by foreign multinational companies. We think about native populations dying for the stealing of their lands and many activists fighting against the destruction of the environment and its biodiversity, like in the Amazon rainforest and in Central America. Climate change and the biodiversity crisis are already making key resources scarcer on the world. Without a clear systemic change, this will unfortunately continue in the next decades, putting the lives of too many people in danger. We all owe all of these people respect, and we dedicate today's work to all the victims of climate change and the biodiversity crisis, asking and starting together our work with this minute of silence. Thank you very much uh, for this moment of uh, commemoration and respect and commitment uh, towards the victims uh, of climate change and the biodiversity crisis. And now, after this, uh, I think it's time to start uh, with the opening panel. And so I would like to give the floor to Amir Karsanathan from the Steering Committee of the Global Student Forum. Thank you very much, Giuseppe. Buenos dias a todos, bonjour tout le monde, greetings all my friends and comrades. My name is Amilka Sanatan and I'm on the steering committee of the Global Student Forum. Environmental justice and the struggle involving climate and biodiversity action for a world that is harmonious, peaceful and fair comes at great cost. Great cost to the quality of air, water, our coastal shores and even the lives of our defenders the environment of all over the world. Students everywhere play an important part in building the future economy, social environment, as well as ethics for living. Today at the Worldwide Student Summit on Climate Action and Biodiversity, we will explore these debates and realities. In the opening plenary, we will capture a picture of what is being done by students and youth for climate and biodiversity. The speakers for today's session we have Marie Claire Graf, Lucia Canaluti, Gianna, Giannina Ramos, and Ankit Tripathi. So before we go ahead, I have to do my brief introduction of these esteemed colleagues and comrades that we have in the opening plenary. Marie Claire Graf, she's a youth advocate, change maker, and public speaker for a just transition towards sustainable development, ambitious climate action through diverse engagement. She's also on the youth constituency of UN Climate Change and has done work around and especially around education work in Sustainability Week International. 
Lucia Canaluti is a board member of OBESU, the Organizing Bureau of European School Student Unions. Prior to that, she served as the president of the School Student Organization of Slovenia. As an OBESU board member, her portfolio consists of global citizenship education, education funding, COVID-19 response, and the environment. Gianina Ramos is from Paraguay, and she's a representative in the Association of Students at her university, UNA. Uh, she likes to combine art and science to try to convey the importance of caring for nature, especially biodiversity. She participates as one of the GYBN Paraguay coordinators and volunteers in the Paraguayan Bat Conservation Program. And last, we would have Ankit Tripathi. Ankit is a student organizer serving as the International Students Representative for the Canadian Federation of Students. He organizes students and advocates with, uh, to challenge politicians in Canada for public funding around post-secondary education and the inclusion of international students in the public service. So we have an esteemed panel here today. I have some questions for them and we would invite you to write your questions and even have live commentary in the chat and we will engage it once we have time and we plan to have that time. So the first thing I would ask, um, and we could start with Marie Claire, is to introduce yourself briefly and discuss the role of youth and students in climate and biodiversity action. Marie. Thank you so much for the brief introduction. As mentioned, my name is Mary Claire and I'm representing here Youngo, the International Youth Network to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So a little bit easier, we are a global network of young dedicated climate activists who are trying to change the international policies on climate. So young people are not only the future, but actually already the present and we do deserve to sit right there where the decisions are taken. That's why it's absolutely important and crucial to give young people the opportunity to actually be there where our future is kind of made, right? The policies which are now going to be implemented at the university, at the United Nations, at the governments, everywhere, they are going to impact us. We are going to live the longest with the consequences. That's why, at least for me, it's very logic that we are involving young people. But not only this, I mean, young people, we all have different competences than our elder counterparts, right? So why are we leaving out half of the world's population and not taking all of this idea into account? I do believe that we have to rapidly change this and that's why I'm so dedicated working not only with Youngo, but also with other, um, with other partners, for example, the SOS International who is also here today on changing this and providing opportunities, especially for young people um, to make their voices heard and be an ally in the fight against the climate and biodiversity crisis. Thank you very much, Marie Claire. Um, next, we'll have Lucia. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. It is very nice to see you. So many, uh, so many faces in this Zoom meeting uh, from all around the world. Um, my name is Lucia Kraniluti, and as I said it before, I am a board member of OBESO, which stands for Organizing Bureau of European School Student Unions. Um, so I will also be giving a perspective not only as a, um, as a member of a really environmental oriented organization, but also more um, wholesomely, wholesomely um, as a representative of school students, um, and also trying to connect it with some of the other issues we are facing in the post-COVID world. Um, for me, um, the fact that we have students involved in this fight is crucial uh, because I truly believe that students are the driving force um, in this climate fight. Um, if it weren't for the students and for the youth voices, uh, we might not even have this, uh, this Zoom um, and this summit at the moment. Um, so I truly believe that it is important that we amplify, that we stand together, amplify youth, youth voices um, and truly recognize um, what youth has done so far um, in many cases without proper education um, and I truly believe that this is a fight uh, that it is the fight of our generation um, and I'm happy to be a part of it either within my organization and offering people uh, resources um, and competences to do so um, or also partnering with other organizations for example Generation Climate Europe um, but more of, more of this a bit later so thank you very much for having me and I'm truly looking forward to this panel today. Thank you very much. Both Marie Claire and Lucia spoke about amplifying student voices, getting the students 
and youth involved in the process of leading that change. Ankit, let's go to you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks, Amilkar. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Ankit. My pronouns are he and him. I am representing the Canadian Federation of Students here at the GSF as a steering committee member. Um, my, origin, my original country of birth and uh, nationality is India, but I study in Canada and therefore re represent Canada here. Um, now, the role of students and young people in climate activism and biodiversity is it can be can be understood when we look at a historical perspective of what students have fought for in the past. Historically, since since before the Great Depression, World War, um, we've seen students at the very forefront of fighting for progressive change, ensuring that the people in the power and positions of power are answered to and are answerable to us. Um, and that kind of work has been led by students and youth for a century now that we've known of and longer still, if we look at the uh, um, further into history. So I think what we see here today is a lot of us coming together, feeling empowered and ensuring that we, we want to achieve things and we want to do it here and we won't do it right now. When it comes to climate change, um, as Marie said, we will live with the consequences of today's policy the longest. And today, even today, we are the ones that are affected the most when it comes to disasters. When the COVID-19 pandemic struck, it was the youth that took a large portion of the brunt, a large brunt portion of the economic downfall in many countries. And better still, when it came to supporting a lot of the critical populations, it was us that led that fight. So I think it's important to uh, acknowledge that position as we organize forward. And I look forward to hearing uh, about what everyone else has to say before. Thank you very much, Ankit. You definitely explained that dread, but also hope in terms of the type of action we could have. Now we'll go to Giannina. Hola, perdón. Eh, tuve que salir porque tuve un problema de internet. No estoy segura de cuál fue la pregunta ahora. There's no problem and uh, in different regions we'll have some challenges as well and depending on the quality of your data and Wi-Fi at home. So you have to pay your bills everyone. But beyond that, uh, Giannina, we were just doing brief introductions among each other. Um, and, but we're also speaking about what is the significance of students and youth to environmental justice, to promoting climate action and biodiversity. Ya, bueno, eh, buenos días a todos. Acá en Paraguay son las 8 de la mañana. Soy Yanina Ramos, eh, estudiante de la carrera de Ingeniería Ambiental. Actualmente soy presidenta de la Asociación de Estudiantes de la Carrera. Así también eh, soy parte de la coordinación de Give en Paraguay y formo parte del programa de conservación de murciélagos del Paraguay como voluntaria. Eh, Algo que caracteriza acá en Paraguay es que justamente muchas de las acciones que se realizan eh, para tratar de ayudar a lo que es la conservación de la biodiversidad o la lucha climática es que son los estudiantes o son los jóvenes quienes más están dentro de estas actividades, son quienes lideran. Eh, muchas veces el gobierno no es que realmente se... Eh, le preocupa el tema o hace algo y estamos nosotros los estudiantes los que estamos exigiendo de que eh, haya una prioridad sobre estos temas los que realizamos voluntariados hacemos esto porque realmente queremos un cambio y no porque esperamos una qué sé yo una compensación económica o, o algún interés en particular sino más que nada lograr el bienestar en eh, de nosotros, porque como dijeron, somos nosotros quienes vamos a sufrir las consecuencias si es que no hacemos algo ahora. Y si es que no fueran por los estudiantes, si no fueran por, por ellos, eh, a lo mejor muchas cosas ahora no se estarían haciendo. Así que creo que eso puedo decir por ahora. Thank you very much, Giannina. Uh, I want to go into this first question. Uh, or this COVID-19 moment. I think it has really challenged governments, development agencies and decision makers with reimagining our societies. Even this idea of a recovery, 
but environmental sustainability is fundamental to any project about this reimagination. All the speakers in the introductions would have touched on that. And as Giannina said, we do this because we believe in a change, not because we are just consultants, not because we are trying to make money off of a good idea. We are really fighting for the world here. I would like to know what are some of the priorities of student and youth movements for an environmentally just recovery? And I'd love to hear from Marie Claire and then Lucia on this. Thank you so much for this very timely and relevant question. And while everyone is trying to build back better, I do not actually like this term a lot because the, what we had before was the problem. That's why we have actually all of this crisis. And actually it's not only the COVID crisis, climate, biodiversity, health inequalities. I mean, you can name them, right? So what I would love to see, and it's like also really driven by especially young people, but of course not exclusively, a movement building for the future with the minds of today, of course, and, and really uniting in this. And I think their students can be such a brilliant resource and we see it already. And I think for this, to make this really happen and have this um, long lasting change, we need to, for example, in the university change the curriculums now that we are preparing the young people of today and tomorrow to be able to, for example, scope with this crisis in a much better way. So we are not just here and feel kind of like the crisis is just put on us and it's taking everything away, but rather using the crisis as an opportunity to develop and seeing how can we adapt because there will be always a crisis is coming, right? Of course, we do not, we can prevent the climate crisis, but there are other things which are coming, but we are not prepared. I personally haven't been feeling prepared. I have been doing my bachelor's. I've been doing, I'm now doing my master's. No one told me how to deal with such a crisis. And I'm one of the privileged ones. I have stable internet here in Switzerland. They have access to food, water, education, everything I need. There's so many young people out there who didn't get the training or didn't get any education how they actually deal with it, nor do they are privileged enough to actually get access to all of the things for the basic things we actually need to survive. So I would love to see that we're using this crisis now, um, not only to, for example, have less flights because we finally realized how much we can actually also do online, but also that we, implement in the curriculum more of self-empowerment, self-awareness, um, how to deal with mental um, challenges like eco-anxiety eco and, and anxiety of the climate crisis and, and many other um, parts and also building more resilience. Um, and what is really, really important is to focus on the solutions. How can we together make an impact? I have been studying environmental sciences and um, we talked for the first year only about the problem, then I quit the program. I was at one of the world's best universities, but it was just so draining to only hear every single day, like in a very objective way, how our planet actually is just going to, or the planet is not dying, but we are dying. And I mean, the planet will be uninhabitable in some parts of the world. We never talked about the solutions. And I think we rapidly need to shift to an education, which is empowering, which is giving us hope. Because if you're losing the hope, it's the same as climate denial, because then we are stuck and paralyzed. We cannot move ahead. And with this crisis also now, the COVID crisis, we see exactly this. People are trying, are still desperately trying to make a change, but there is this movement of like, we just want to go back and nothing should change and so on. And this is so wrong. We should really, really use this crisis. This is saying never waste a good crisis. It's already here. We're trying our best, but let's use it and build forward together. Thank you very much, Marie Claire. Um, you, you really put forward the issue of that environmental education from sense of the climate, biodiversity, which we will discuss in more detail in one of our parallel sessions. And um, but you disrupted the idea of recovery, Lucia. Um, your turn. Are we should we let go of this language of recovery and and what does creation of this future look like now in the present? First of all, I have to say that I highly, highly agree with Marie Claire, especially being here representative of school students. Um, in the first line, of course, we have to advocate for um, equality um, environmental education in schools because um, as of now, it is barely, it is actually non-existent. Um, and everything that school students and activists learned is pretty much 
on their own. And I think that actually this is also one of the things that this crisis um, has allowed us to have time to actually also do some extra curricular and enroll in that different webinars to learn something new. Um, and I've heard some uh, many different testimonials from school students that they actually had time um, to figure out not only to what it means to be an activist and to go, you know, to participate in Friday for Future, but actually what's behind um, what's behind the problem, what, what are the problems and how to solve them, how to search for solutions. Um, so I highly agree, yes, with Marie Claire on this. So we need um, climate um, education, um, but I also agree that this um, that this um, crisis has, of course, offered us um, some of the maybe not not benefits, but like some head start. Because um, I do I do um, think that many of the world leaders um, and different businesses have seized this pandemic um, as a chance to build more sustainable economies, uh, to invest in green energy, um, and also it was nice to see that highly polluted places were finally were able to take quite literally a breath of fresh air and even. If a short term to recover. Um, but um, I also have to put forward the fact that um, I also do believe that um, if you want to successfully uh, join in this environment to just, uh, just recovery, um, and also what Marie Claire also said, that to have actually people still empowered and not exhausted from everything that is going on in the world, um, I think it's also important that we tackle other crises as well, uh, because especially young people um, were put in this during the last two years um in really uncomfortable position um where i think that also we we were in this in educational crisis mental health crisis um and also economical one um and i really do uh, think that if you want to young people to feel competent competent and confident uh, to continue with this climate fight we also must think in consideration other crises uh, where they were affected um, and also help to tackle those um and then Consequently, them to be more um, more confident in taking on um, this climate fight. Um, so I think yeah, this is this were these are the main priorities, um, but also the one that has to stay every time when we're talking about young people and climate fight is just the, the number one priority is to be seen as relevant actors, uh, because way too often young people are you know the tick to one of the invitees to say that we have young people and young voices at the table, uh, but way too often we're not listened to. Um, so I truly feel that um, maybe this year and a half uh, gave us um, some of the realization that young people are actually the driving force um, of our society. Um, and also the fact that we fought now one crisis quite successfully, hopefully. Um, and we, I think now we all see that we do have resources to actually take the climate fight um, as a number one priority um, and truly start fighting today. Thank you very much, Lucia. I think you spoke to some of those intersecting issues. And quite interestingly, we were talking about when we have a place at the table and, and what is the meaning of having a place at the table? But there are many tables that have been shifting in the globe. We see some political changes in the United States, which has led to a different type of tone and commitments around the climate and biodiversity. In the European Union, there are certain conversations around commitments to green economies coming out of COVID-19. In Chile, they're talking about not just access to water, but how does the environment feature the recognition of the rights of indigenous peoples in the constitution? Ankit and Gianina, I'm interested in understanding what are some of the key achievements we have made as a student and youth movement around environmental justice, particularly around COVID-19. This is not just an existential threat. We want to acknowledge the work of the defenders and the fighters everywhere. What are some models, examples, and cases we can look at to say work is being done and some success is being had? Could start with Gianina. Sí, claro. Eh, acá en Paraguay, o sea, en primer lugar, comparto totalmente lo que dijeron las, las compañeras o las chicas. Algo muy difícil acá en Paraguay es que a pesar de la pandemia, es como que las autoridades no toman conciencia de que lo que está ocurriendo ahora es justamente por nuestra relación con la naturaleza. Es como que no, 
no hay una consecuencia de eso para tomar acciones y proteger eh, a la biodiversidad, proteger nuestros recursos naturales, realizar acciones que ayuden a todo lo que tenga que ver con el clima. Y ahí es donde entramos los, los jóvenes. Y lo que quiero resaltar que se logró a pesar de la pandemia, a pesar de que, la, que muchas veces no podíamos salir, acá en... En Paraguay, por ejemplo, realizamos eh, la primera restauración, o por lo menos intentamos una restauración de un bosque que, fue, que se incendió. El año pasado hubo muchos incendios forestales acá en, en Paraguay, fue muy difícil. Y nosotros eh, participamos como voluntarios en esa actividad para tratar de restaurar y realizar algo, porque las autoridades no van a hacer nada. También en eh, algo particular acá en Paraguay es que nosotros tenemos una ley que se llama Ley de Deforestación Cero, que es para evitar que haya eh, la tala de, de los bosques de árboles en la región oriental del país. Y es una ley que se tendría que renovar cada tres años y nosotros eh, nos unimos los estudiantes juntos con otras organizaciones para exigirle al gobierno que se renueva esta ley. Que, eh, y se amplíe, logramos que se amplíe por 10 años más, es decir que por otros 10 años más por lo menos nuestros bosques van a estar todavía protegidos y, pero la, la, la lucha sigue eh, eso se logró a través de manifestaciones a través de presión en redes sociales eh, porque era necesario que las autoridades nos puedan escuchar y así también con, contra los incendios forestales el año pasado hicimos manifestaciones de los estudiantes de la carrera de Ingeniería Ambiental junto con otras asociaciones para tratar de que las autoridades nos escuchen. Y algo más que quiero agregar es que eh, también estamos cada vez más involucrados en lo que es en la participación de, para organizar ciertos temas a nivel gubernamental, como por ejemplo planes o lo que tenga que ver con la protección de áreas protegidas que muchas veces no nos escuchaban, pero ahora eh, nos, dieron, nos socializaron proyectos antes de que se aprueben para que nosotros podamos dar nuestra opinión. Todavía falta mucho, pero se, en, en, estos poco, en este poco tiempo se logró también mucho a la vez. Thank you very much, Giannina, for that powerful narrative about people's power the capacity of the students contributing to literally protecting the environment and putting their lives at risk, but also thinking about the policy. Anket, I'll go to you. And um, I would love to hear your feedback. And also, if you can give some commentary on the state of what has happened in India when we saw the struggle with the farmers as well, but also how a global South economy, what is considered as emerging and a vaccine producing nation is struggling with COVID-19 and the health risks and bodies turning up in the water. It has been very difficult um, and it becomes complex in these narratives. Ankit? Yeah, thank you for that, Amilkar. And Gian, you're so right, uh, Janina, that a lot of the times we don't get the space on the table. And when we do, we try to make most of it. And even still, when we're invited, we're often ignored. Um, but before I get to a lot of, um, uh, a lot of the questions, Asked, I think I want to acknowledge some of the cultural and rhetorical things we've seen since the start of the pandemic. Um, are some things that are beautiful. When during the first lockdown in March and April last year, many people in large cities across the world saw stars in the sky for the first time ever. Conver uh, ever since then, we've seen the conversations around air pollution, environmental health, um, urban biodiversity, all of these conversations and research has seen um, a huge boost. A lot more people are now talking about these things because they saw those things change during lockdowns and during the pandemic's early stages. And this also brought a lot of money to research in, in, uh, in urban air, air, air quality and environmental health. Um, we saw a lot of, uh, a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, research on the state of air quality before and after the pandemic, how it changed in different kinds of economies, in different states, different cities across the world, global north and south. And I think that's pushed research in a, in a direction that challenges a lot of the narratives 
that along climate denial, that these things don't exist and that they don't have an impact. In India specifically, we've, we're quite popular for having really bad air quality and by as as a result, um, a lot of deaths, even other outside of the pandemic, happen because of the poor air quality that we've seen. Today, that is manifesting as a much higher death rate during the second wave of ours because air quality in many cities like Delhi, Mumbai, any big cities really in India or any manufacturing city in India, which is a lot of cities, um, people there are like experiencing much higher death rates because of COVID, because air quality is so bad, a lot of people have pre-existing conditions of asthma, and the government is ridiculously undercounting the number of people that have contracted the virus and have died from it. Not to mention that all of this has something to do with environmental justice. Access to better air and an area where there is relatively less bad air quality is a purely economic uh, access. If you make more money, you're allowed to live somewhere a little bit further because you can afford private transportation, you can afford to drive into the city for work, and you can also afford, you know, working from home. Whereas if you're not, you know, economically that far up, then you have to go into work, you have to take public transit, you have to be exposed. All of these are environmental justice issues that are seeing a lot of exacerbation during uh, COVID-19. Now, at the beginning of the pandemic, Something that was good to hear is that India's transport minister actually announced to electrify the entire public transit uh, fleet by 2030. It's an ambitious goal, but when achieved and clubbed with our understanding of public transit as a legitimate solution to a lot of climate change and fixing air, uh, air quality in urban environments, this sounds like a pretty good proposition. If it happens, I would be extremely happy. However, I'll keep my, <laughs> I, I'm, so I will, keep my reservations on the side right now. I'd also like to acknowledge a lot of the growing support that we've seen um, in the global north. In Canada specifically, throughout the pandemic, thousands of people joined in solidarity with indigenous land defenders and fishers from coast to coast as they fought for access access to their fishing water that was traditionally theirs and taken away by settlers, access to drinking water that they haven't had access to in many reserves and in many uh, reserves, if you will, because they're marginalized from their own land. Um, and even there, Canada with the country with the number one access to drinking water per capita in the whole world does not give access to their in indigenous people. It's ridiculous. Further still, uh, um, there was a hurricane on the East Coast last summer from which a lot of, from, uh, on which indigenous people were one of the biggest affected populations. All of these things are seeing a lot of support in Canada. And during the pandemic, there has been a lot of activism that has seen great F support. Whereas in the past, that was not a thing. A lot more people were very critical of indigenous people and their actions because they got tax breaks. I don't get it but that's a legit, that's a legit thing you, you can hear. And it's, and further still, the, the pipeline out west is seeing more and more activism as indigenous people in Alberta and British Columbia continue to fight for sovereignty of their land so that the federal government doesn't just bulldoze all over it and build a pipeline that they haven't consented to. Um, and these are all environmental justice issues that are seeing environmental justice responses. Now, in the state of Canada, it is quite sad to see that there hasn't been enough of a policy response to address any of these issues, as they're too busy discussing national politics that is purely political and has nothing to do with real life implications on people in any strata, anywhere, students, young people, indigenous people, people of color. But I think this presents us with an opportunity, an opportunity where a lot more young people have now acquainted themselves with progressive green policies in the state of North America, the Green New Deal happens to be one of those things. At the, at the early stages of the pandemic in last summer, we saw oil prices drop internationally because um, OPEC had an internal dispute. But with that drop, we saw funding increasing for green tech and expansion of um, the green economies throughout the global North. And to me, that's a good, that, that's a good sign because while we're trying to get governments to move into policy, a lot of our right-wing and centrist, uh, centrist uh, colleagues believe that the market needs to agree. And I think the drop in those oil prices last, um, last summer are one of those indicators. So the markets are beginning to agree that oil is not here for much longer. And that brought, by, brought around a divestment that was very good to see. I think these are some of the victories we've seen, but we've got a long ways to go. So I'm curious to see 
what else we can come up with here today. That's great. Thank you very much, Ankit, for that panoramic view of it um, and the struggles that are happening, uh, but also the possibilities for change. I would like to go to Giannina now to discuss what are some of the challenges uh, youth and students experience mobilizing during a pandemic for environmental justice. And I know you have concrete experiences. Can you discuss some of those challenges? And then I'll give way to Marie Claire to give some responses on this question as well. Okay, creo que entre los desafíos que nosotros tenemos, en primer lugar está la de poder hacer llegar la información a las a las personas. Si bien estamos muchos estudiantes involucrados en lo que es la parte del activismo, también hay muchos que no lo están. Y muchas veces es porque no saben cuál es su potencialidad o no saben que también puede ser líderes en, en los que ellos quieran. No, no, a veces están muy concentrados en lo que es la parte de, de, de la universidad, de las materias y más ahora en donde con la virtualidad se hizo muy difícil muchas veces porque es como que tenemos una sobrecarga de trabajo. Eh, algo muy difícil es que más personas se, se llegan a involucrar. De cierta forma siempre estamos las mismas personas luchando, las mismas personas activando y eh, buscamos la manera de llegar a ellos. Otra, otro desafío es la de llegar a las personas que están fuera de lo que es la parte de, de, del área ambiental es como que no están muy metidos en el tema, entonces no les importa, no les interesa, no, no participan y queremos también hacerles llegar información de la importancia de todo lo que estamos haciendo, de por qué es importante eh, el poder proteger nuestros recursos, de por qué tenemos que luchar por ellos y de repente cuesta más eh, ahora en donde no podemos hablar directamente sino a través de la virtualidad y ahí hay problemas de el acceso al internet eh, personas que de repente están más en el interior y no es más difícil poder conectarse con ellas creo que eso es lo que más eh, nos cuesta ahora y también el, el hacer que el, el gobierno nos tome realmente en cuenta si bien ya hay algunas algunas cosas en las que estamos participando eh, todavía falta mucho para que, que el gobierno realmente tome en cuenta nuestras opiniones, nos dé más participación y creo que más que nada eso. Thank you very much, Jenny. I think you really spoke to some of the challenges we have with our political communications as well as a, a serious kind of uh, inhibition to some of our organizing, but that is something we need to address, I think, collectively moving ahead and strategically. Marie Claire, some of the challenges that you identified in your movements as well. Yeah, thanks so much. I think it's very important to, to identify this, these challenges to be able to have strategies to um, yeah, that, that, we can, that we can overcome them. So while we um, in Young Girl have been always working um, online because we are a global network with young people from 180 countries. So for us, not too much changed in this regard into communication. And Janine, I mean, I, I, I very much agree on the internet issues. I mean, we have certain countries where we have very low participation and we know exactly where this is coming from language barriers. And I'm really applauding also all the um, translations today here in the call, but also the access to internet um, or at least to stable internet. But I also wanted to point out something else. A lot of students and young people have been working on the site to their studies or to their engagement, because very often the, the whole engagement and activism is not paid, have been working maybe in a local restaurant or in a hotel, you know, like in the evening. And exactly these sectors have been so heavily affected by the COVID pandemic. And these people are the least protected by any laws. They can, because they are like paid on hour, you can just end the contract whatever. So these young people have been suddenly like no, not earning their minimal income they had been using for sustaining their lives, paying their rents, paying the health insurances, paying the bills, paying the education. And what we have seen in Switzerland that um, a lot of cantons and, and governments have been jumping in, but I also know many governments haven't been doing so and at least for the first wave and for the first moment, completely forgetting about these young people because they were not in the risk group so they completely forgot that many young people suddenly 
are here standing in front of big debts because of because of this. I think this is a very important consideration, um, and also goes in line that um, that whenever we are also doing actions on, on climate and so whatever, it's really amazing. But we have to keep in mind that there are some people who are not able to spend um, time, unpaid time on, on volunteer engagement. I think it's a very, very important um, consideration also when we work internationally. I do have the privilege having a well-paid job that I can spend my time on this, but there are many young people who unfortunately do not have this privilege. And I think it's very important, not only in and after the pandemic, but in general to realize um, that we also have to be inclusive in this regard. And many people are struggling, or many young people are especially struggling with um, the financial consequences. And I, I really hope that we can yeah, also improve ourselves as an organization, as a network um, from, from this crisis in, in this regard. Thank you very much, Janine and Marie Claire. I, I, I think sometimes we uh, under, what is the word? we de-emphasize that real human beings lead these changes and it demands an effort to persons are in material conditions and economic constraints and uh, our movements seem to be sensitive to that in order to really make sure that we are committed to their humanity as well and, and fair in the work that we do that's part of our ethics um i would like to go to lucia and ankit here um if you could briefly let us know Climate and biodiversity action requires global responses by united students and youth organizing for transformation. So what mechanisms and platforms should students and youth actively engage with to support movements and organizations across the globe? We have a, a large global community here and I think it's for all of our benefit to know what mechanism and platforms exist that we could use. I'll start with Lucia and then we'll go to Ankit. Yes, thank you for your question. Um, so yeah, of course, um, with the climate fight and the climate change, the most important thing is that we have to be united and stand together. Um, we all know the motto, of course, united we stand, um, divided we fall. So I think this truly applies to the climate fight um, and I would say that um, if there are any individuals who don't know where to start on which plan who to reach which platform to use for example um, I think that what's also one of the things that COVID crisis has shown us that you can start on real local level um, I was really actually impressed in my own country um, we were just um, fighting this a lot that passed uh, that allowed people to uh, build buildings really near the, the water sites um, and just today actually we filed 50,000 signatories which might not be a lot but it is a lot for a small country like Slovenia um, for a referendum um, to turn overturn this uh, this law and I think that even small initiatives like this that happen truly on a local level um, are actually a really good motivator for people to later stay and be engaged um, in these movements so if you have if you have any European school students maybe among uh, either on Facebook if anyone's watching and you can start by joining your local um, or national organization you can later join also BESO um, and if you have any Europeans also we have um, I spoke about this at the beginning um, the, the while ago I think now it was two years uh, we have created a generation climate Europe which is the largest largest coalition of European youth led organizations um, so I truly believe that there are you know a lot of initiatives initiatives where you can get involved. Um, you just have to find the, the right fit for yourself um, and stay, stay included and stay united with people because only in this way we can actually uh, work something out and truly make a change. Yeah, I think Lucia is sure enough with 50,000 signatures. That's pretty amazing from a mobilization standpoint. But congratulations that uh, organizing could achieve that. But to your broader points uh, and looking at the regional platforms and the local student unions that we could have as sites for change, Ankit? Yeah, um, I think to address the question directly, um, if there's any place you want to find play more organizations to connect to, it is here today and right now. Um, there's a lot of us here, a lot of our organizing partners, a lot of the fantastic speakers in their respective organizations. If you want to connect with the work of what the youth and students are doing in, this, in the sphere of climate change, biodiversity and climate action, then it's here and right now. Um, for future, we'll, we will be back 
but also um, as, as Lucia said, it's the, the most important work is often done at the local levels. Um, and I think it's best to find the organizations where you can, um, you can work with directly within your localities. Um, if you're in Canada, uh, there, there's quite a few organizations we have there. If you're in India, G uh, Gibbon has a pretty good, um, a, a strong base here. Um, and just, just keep in touch. There's a lot of, I'm also seeing a lot of organizations and folks um, putting uh, dropping in links in the chat. So keep an eye there uh, for more organizations to keep in touch with. Um, there's, there's a lot of good information out there. I think it's unfortunate that we don't have a centralized platform for them, but let's hope that the GSF can be that platform in the near future. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I would like to acknowledge one of the comments um, from Raluca Zaharia around gradual change and, and being as part of something sustainable, sustainable change over a period of time. And uh, Zaharia was really trying to emphasize the idea of adopting a post-human approach to this crisis, but I think even our organizing, and that would be very interesting. Um, but Richard Fransham, Fransham sorry, um, made an interesting contribution on decolonizing education. And I think this would be the last question I would have for everyone here. Um, how do we decolonize education? Where addressing ecological inequalities is fundamental to that. Harmony with the environment is fundamental to that. Challenging ideas of modernity and even capitalism, which abuses our natural landscape um, I think is part of decolonizing education broadly. So um, can you please respond to this quickly and then we can give your closing remarks and we'll go Marie Claire, Lucia, Giannina and then Ankit. And that is not my order of favorites. That is just the way that we started. So thank you. Thank you so much. And the very, very, very crucial question which will probably like, um, yeah, be with us for, for quite some time. I do not think that we will be able to transform the formal education system in time to make these changes happen when it comes to when it comes to different economic systems when it comes to decolonization when it comes to international trend, trade and so on because the current professors have been growing up in a certain mindset with a certain kind of education that's why i think it's absolutely crucial that we as students are coming together and educating ourselves in a non-formal i don't really like it because i think it's also a very formal way but anyway like let's just call it non-formal way of educating ourselves building groups um and then also try to infiltrate this in the system what we have been doing um in zurich that's the biggest city of switzerland there was a group uh, working on on degrowth and other um other pluralistic um um, economic uh, movements, and they have been managing to set up um, around, how, how can I translate this? Basically, yeah, there are 14 weeks of, um, of lectures, and every, and every week there was another um, professor or another um, person from a different stream of a new economic model coming, um, and they could manage actually to bring this to the, uh, to the curriculum system. So it was not a mandatory course, of course, very sadly. Nevertheless, it was there, so more students could be inspired. In the beginning, Many students have been very skeptical. They didn't sign up. In the second year, actually, it was growing a lot. Now in the third year, it was actually really like a boomer. So a lot of people have been very, very interested in this and learning more. So I think it's very important that we ourselves first like have this very hard process of decolonizing because it means unlearning that we are able to learn again. Um, because I mean, also myself, I've been growing up, things were told to me and this is how I saw the world. And then suddenly I realized well, this is not how everyone sees the world. This is not how everyone is getting teached. So it needs a lot of unlearning. And I think this is a very important process, which you're also not really teach on how to unlearn things. So let's support each other in this unlearning process. And also working on an international space, very often getting invitations. Lately, I got an invitation to talk about um, something um, somewhere in the south of Africa. And it's like, why are you asking me? I am from Switzerland. I have never been there. I have no local context. Why are you not asking a local speaker who actually knows about the challenges? So what I have been doing, I gave my um, speaking opportunity to a local person from there. And I think this is something um, we can all do to try to find other people who might have more to say to a certain issue, especially also when it comes to decolonization, giving the people who are affected the word um, and opening doors and opportunities for them. You see her. Thank you, Marie Claire. Um, I have to say that I think Marie Claire was kind of really 
really nicely summed up everything, especially like the part um, about unlearning. I think it's very true. Um, and actually this topic of decolonization and decolonizing um, curricula um, is also one of the priorities for the next year, um, also in Obeso. Um, so if, if anyone's interested, I can also tell more about that. Uh, but apart from unlearning, um, I also think it's very important uh, for to recognize and for to push for national curricula to stop vehiculating stereotypes and misconceptions of other cultures and et ethnicities. Um, I think that a way of doing so, um, of course, is also to teach students. So now if you're also speaking about um, school students, for example, which is really hard to know this kind of topic, uh, for them to unlearn and learn on their own. Um, but I think it's very important yeah, to teach students um, about also the many valuable contributions uh, to our world from civilizations that have been oppressed uh, through history and also often portrayed as primitive. Um, and I think this is one of the things that we really must strive towards to implement in our curricula, um, especially also um, in connection to the climate fight, because um, I think that climate, climate injustice goes hand in hand with, uh, with the social injustice. And given that climate fight is not, it's not territorial, so it's not something that you know only one person or one region uh, can do. And I think Marie Claire uh, said it at the very beginning that also to be able to fight the climate change is a sort of privilege because you have to have resources to be able to do so and to make more sustainable choices. Um, so I think also in this context, um, it, is, it is very important. Thank you very, very much, Lucia. Gianina, can you give the closing remarks? We're wrapping up this session before we I give way to my comrade Giuseppe, who will tell us where we can go in multiple directions. Gianina. Claro. Um, estoy muy de acuerdo con lo que mencionó Marie Claire, el hecho de que a lo mejor no se va a poder lograr una transformación a tiempo. Y es, es una pregunta súper compleja. Um, como estudiante de la carrera de Ingeniería Ambiental, incluso en nuestra carrera, en donde todo lo que tenemos son materias relacionadas a la parte ambiental, falta mejorar muchas cosas en el aspecto curricular. Y es ese espacio de la Asociación de Jóvenes lo que brinda el poder complementar lo que nos enseñan los profesores, que muchas veces es, muy, es más teórico o no se lleva tanto a la práctica o incluso no es que se, hay mucho activismo, es esa asociación en donde nosotros podemos lograr o complementar lo que estamos aprendiendo. Pero aparte también está el desafío de poder cambiar las demás, o sea, de poder hacer que lo ambiental sea más transversal a todas las carreras, no solamente el nuestro, que de por sí ya estamos ahí, es más difícil llegarle a, a los estudiantes de otras carreras que no están muy metidos en lo ambiental, en, y no solamente a nivel de la universidad, sino también estudiantes de colegios, de escuelas, cómo cambiar lo que los adultos aprendieron y meter la, la parte ambiental dentro de la educación. Es, tiene que haber un gran cambio, pero se, empieza, se puede empezar desde, por lo menos entre estudiantes, e ir avanzando, pero el cambio tiene que ser en todas las áreas, entonces es súper, súper complejo. Thank you very, very, very much, Gianina, for your contribution. Friends, comrades, and students, thank you very much for taking part in the Worldwide Summit on Climate Action and Biodiversity. This was our opening session, and we're going to have more discussions. We really appreciate the feedback we have had so far, but none of this would have been possible if we didn't have the intelligence and the political knowledge and skill sets of Marie Claire, Lucia, Gianina and Ankit. So many thanks. Um, and now we'll give way to Giuseppe, who will tell us how we'll move ahead. Thank you very much, Amilcar, and thank you very much to our lovely panelists of the first opening panel. Uh, now we are going to go into parallel sessions. So I'll show you, first of all, how it's going to work. So parallel sessions, I, I hope everything can be clearly seen uh, in the plenary at the moment. So parallel sessions, uh, 
uh, will last one hour and uh, will happen only in, Eng in English language. So whoever does not speak that language or doesn't work to want to does not want to work in that language can stay in the plenary, can go for a coffee and then come back to the next plenary really uh, as you wish. But there are very powerful speakers. So I suggest everyone to try staying in and joining them. So here you can see the, that there are many parallel breakout rooms uh, with all of the sessions and uh, you should choose your, your own room. Uh, there should be a button to, to join uh, this room and uh, Sorry, things started to appear to me. Uh, so uh, I don't know how to, how to close it at the moment. Okay, um, so uh, you can join these rooms. You can see the three topics. Transformative education for a sustainable future, a student's concern. Working together instead of alongside each other. Exploring synergies between the student movement and youth-led environmental justice groups. Lessons from the past, guiding the future. Bold environmental justice action to save our planet so when uh, the sessions will start you are going to have a participant rapporteur that will be chosen among participants that will summarize everything at the end of the session so taking notes during the sessions and paying a lot of attention to everything they said so in the plenary there's going to be a reporting for everyone and uh, you will learn more about this process directly while you enter the rooms so I think that almost everything uh, relevant was said. Uh, now, we are going to go into a break. So we're going to have some free time, 10 minutes. And after that, we are going to enter all of the breakout rooms. So I suggest the people that want to participate to stay online here, just switch off the camera and go for a coffee, go to the toilet, whatever is needed, and then uh, come back here, enter the room you prefer so you can uh, you can do everything and participate in the fullest way in this event. Thank you very much. And for the people following on Facebook, thank you very much for being here and uh, uh, see you again in more or less one hour with the plenary that will be again live streamed on Facebook. Thanks. Thank you very much and have a nice break. Uh, can I ask one question if that's okay? Absolutely. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, uh, the breakout rooms will start in 10 minutes, right? Yes, we will start exactly in 10 minutes with the breakout rooms. Okay, I understood everything correctly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. I was wondering if it's okay to break the silence for a silly question. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I can tell that there is an absolute wreck of stuff that's going on around climate sustainability, climate movement, political climate, uh, climate justice. And it's just such a huge network of issues that are interconnected. And that takes me to wonder, what do you believe is the single most important issue that you have to address in order to kickstart the change in all the others? Like what's the Pareto law of climate change? What is that 28% uh, impact that we're looking for? So we can speed this up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this question. I don't know, since we are officially in a break, I think we can have a, a bit of an open discussion for those of you who are still in the main room and feel like it. Um, I think it was a very interesting question that was posed. So if anyone, either of the speakers or the participants wants to give their opinion, their perspective on this question, please uh, go ahead and take the floor. Oh, by all means, anybody can take up this question and just give uh, brain food to it. I'm here, should I go? 
Um, so my name's Hugh. Um, it's Papa, is it? Nice to meet you. Um, yeah, it's a big question, and I, I suppose you know. I mean, I, I've just to introduce me. I'm working with the um, Open Society Foundation. We quite partners with the, the student movement on, on a number of things. <clears throat> But um, I think there are a range of things. One of the things that a number of organizations are trying for this year is to get uh, quality climate education to be um, adopted as all part of all of the school curricula. You know, so that's something that, that can be done. And then the uh, idea is to make sure that that's linked at least to the civics um, part of the curriculum so that it has a strong social action component. It would be the wrong thing just to turn it into an exam subject, right? But if it's something that can, can recognize the the initiative and, and action that students have been taking uh, on, on climate uh, on the climate crisis it can be very helpful so that's just one way but i mean i, I think we really think the the key thing is the mobilization of the organized student movement to keep um governments uh, accountable to to their promises and to keep keep their feet to the fire so to speak may i uh, respond you. also by all means, Richard, please do so. So, Papa, thanks for the, the answer and, and Hugh for your, your contribution. Uh, you can see that I'm an older person. I'm a retired teacher who's uh, been a, a problem for educators from the time I started teaching. And uh, I, I'm convinced that uh, I had something in the chat that, that we need to decolonize our schools, that changing the curriculum uh, is certainly something that needs to happen but over time we need to um, create the opportunity for students to pursue with their time the things they want to do and schools are, are too much right now uh, demanding things of students that take them away from their their biggest concerns but we need to put students in control of what they want to uh, do with their time and how they want to shape the the world and so I'm uh, involved with groups that are, are looking at defining that, the democratic school movement, the unschool school approach to it. It's basically uh, self-directed learning and uh, people have misconceptions about that. It's, uh, it's very powerful. Uh, I'm uh, retired and so I have time and uh, I'm trying to rally adult support for youth initiatives. I had a, a link to, um, a video that was created through a conference that I ran with uh, youth speaking about their views on sociocracy. And there's another link in their uh, statement on education by uh, a young lady, uh, Zineb uh, Muhai, and uh, very powerful statements by youth. So uh, I believe what what the youth have said in that, that video that I mentioned, that, that the youth today are the generation we've been waiting for. And I wanna do what I can to help unite people around youth actions. We see the power and the passion among the people on this call, it's, uh, it's really inspiring. Uh, I've been involved lately with a, an effort to create a, a youth rights day on November 20th, the, the UN day that's declared the World Children's Day, which is um, uh, to celebrate the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And, and that means the rights of young people to me, youth included. And so to create a, a single day where we can all come together and maybe grab enough world attention that we get up to that 28% and beyond. Thanks for listening. On the contrary, thank you very much for that response. Um, and I really appreciate that you're nailing the main issue. Like we need to start changing from the bottom up. It is a long uh, term investment into our, our youth so that the future might be better. But that's the way that's been done for thousands and thousands of years. We're always placing our hopes in the future and that you decided to uh, share your expertise 
with these people by taking away from you to give him more to the ones that are yet to come. I believe that you're taking the right approach to this issue. And thank you very much for those two very plentiful, very wholesome responses with a huge broad perspective on this topic. I could go for hours about thousands of proposals that I have in, in the shower or in my head while falling asleep. But I think that it always boils down into education and ju climate justice as the main core of that education. Thank you very much. I am Ernesto Ojeda. I am the regional coordinator of the Americas for the 16th UN Conference of Youth. And the name Papa Jaguar comes because I am the currently the leader of the Fire Jaguars Americas team. Um, I am very much pleased to be here and I am eager to continue in this conference. Thank you. Papa, I put my email address and Hugh also, if, if you're interested in following up with me, email address in, in the chat. And I would very much like to follow up with you if you would contact me. Absolutely. I think that we could have a very, very healthy uh, conversation, maybe on a, on a Zoom meeting trans or an interview even. Thank you. I think this, this break was uh, put to best use indeed. Um, we are now going to resume in two minutes with the breakout rooms. I see that some colleagues have already assigned themselves to the breakout rooms that they wish to attend. Um, for money, that is not the case yet. So um, in two minutes, we're going to start the sessions in the breakout rooms. So please uh, choose one of the breakout rooms and assign yourself into the breakout room so we can resume in two minutes. Sebastian, can you move me to the breakout room three? Because I cannot on my own. I don't know why. Very good. I will do that. Um, for those of you who have the same issue, just let me know, but it should be possible. Come and breakout room four. Thank you. If you write into the chat your preferred break at room, I will send you in there automatically. Could you please share the breakout room numbers again in the topic? I can't see them on the screen. Breakout room one is uh, on transformative education. Breakout room two uh, is on synergies between the students' movement and uh, youth-led environmental justice. And breakout room three is lessons from the past guiding the future. Okay, thank you so much. When I go to the breakout rooms, I see the list of who's in them, but when I click on it, it doesn't take me to the, the room I'd, I'd like to be in, in two. Thank you very much, Richard. I will assign you there.
You said two, right? Yes, please. So anyone here in this room that uh, wants to be assigned? If so, please make yourself known.
Hi, everyone. Good morning for those who are close to me. Good evening and good night, uh, depending on each part of the world you are. My name is Bianca. I'm a Brazilian student and also a member of OCLI, our continental organization for Latin America and Caribbean. And right now, uh, I would like to talk to you and actually ask you to bring the reports on your parallel sessions. So what we would like to know here uh, is the main conclusion of the discussions you just had on the breakout rooms. So for the parallel one, who wants to present? Is this for parallel session one? Yes. Yeah, that would be myself. So I'll present. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. How are you? My name is Megan O'Neill and I am part of an organisation called the Union of Students in Ireland. And I'll be reporting back on parallel session one. So some of the main areas that we talked about, one would be access. So we think it's vitally important that access and education um, is vital in supporting learners to contribute towards a sustainable future to orient education to fulfill the needs of our planet and those that live on it. We also feel it is really important to decolonize, decolonize sorry, education and to have a societal shift in how we connect with what our role is and how we can better our education to be a positive tool. And we also think there are some root causes of both environmental and social issues and how they're intertwined that we need to teach at school level that we are one with nature. Some challenges come from the formal education that can be a barrier to culture. This needs to change if education is to be a tool to educate youth on climate action while being res respectful and conscious of different cultures. We also feel that it is equi it, it should be equitable to all to access and include to access education, including those that are the most marginalized. It is vitally important that we value indigenous um, values and beliefs. Um, an example of a positive impact from the pandemic would be um, that platforms have been created to inform those on sustainable development, like the platform that we find ourselves on today. Education for sustainable development. In order to teach and learn, we need to ensure that students aren't just gaining knowledge. It is seen as a way that educate, educators can embed learning in a way which students can become agents of a positive change. And this will include attitudes, values and beliefs in learnings to empower students to be active agents for positive change. We feel that pro project education is very important and that um, to wrap up in conclusion that we should have an organised constituency of students and teachers working together on local, regional and national levels to build a movement to change the curriculum. And this is where we believe we should start. We need to advocate for transformative education and put pressure on decision decision makers to drive policy change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Megan, for the parallel show. It's actually nice to meet you as well. As well. So, hi everyone. My name is Marie. Um, I'm the vice president for equality and citizenship in the Union of Students in Ireland. Um, so, our group had some fantastic feedback, and thanks so much, Sam and Monica, for leading that discussion. Um, our question was in regard to finding the synergies between the student movement and the environmental justice um, movement and groups. Um, so, we had some great conversations in regards to the benefits and challenges, um, particularly around the clear relationship between climate justice and social justice issues, um, engaging and supporting local grassroots movements, um, and ensuring they have a voice um, to access um, rooms they might not necessarily have a voice in. And then we had issues of sustainability and social justice moving from the outside or the periphery into the more core work of student movement and student um, led groups. We then had a conversation in regard to that student movement and student groups often have seats and power on committees and different um, areas of power that they can bring in the student justice or the environmental justice groups into and ensuring that their voice is heard in those groups is so, so important. Um, the collaboration with action-led groups and representation groups is so important because oftentimes action-led groups and particularly around the environmental justice groups have the ability to pivot and move quick, can move quickly compared to those who are in regard to student-led groups that often can't move quickly or can't pivot as quickly. 
Um, the awareness and inclusion of diverse understanding and vision in youth and student movements is so, so important. We have three pages notes, so <laughs> bear with me. Um, then we had a conversation around the inability of working class communities and students to engage in climate movement. The working class um, are working against the issue of tokenism and having students there towards the end rather than having them at the very, very beginning for conversations where they're brought in. And we had the reference from Zamzam how they're brought from a working group to a working group to a working group of a working group. Uh, it's often how far can they actually engage in that, how much influence and sway do they have. Then we had a point in regard to collaboration, engaging working class students in particular, being inclusive and creating a platform and um, giving different perspectives. And uh, Monica spoke about the cross pollination between student movement and the environmental youth groups um, and ensuring our movements are intersectional and rooted in social justice issues. Um, we also then spoke about the willingness to share campaigns and work um, across the groups and across movements. It's so important to share knowledge and share resources. Um, and to ensure our partnerships are resilient um, because oftentimes in youth groups and student-led groups and in student movement as a whole we can see that quick turnaround oftentimes you're elected for a year maybe less and um, you're only there for a short amount of time and how you want to get as much impact as possible but the reality is the work you're doing could be carried on by your successor or passing on that information passing on that um, goal is so so important um, because often students and student movement and student groups are a gateway to change um, and we pass along projects and campaigns. Um, and then oftentimes we had a, it was a challenge or an issue in regards to student movement was that it often becomes more accustomed or used to the system and we can often become absorbed by that while active groups and student environmental groups because they're quite on the ground may not have that um, sense of become part of the system so they're more active and more um, engaged in regards to issues on the ground. Um, and then we had a conversation about youth having a common goal and a need for that and ensuring that we do have a common area and um, are working towards that because we often have a lot of similar similarities um, but we're often bogged down on the stats or the percentages but if we keep moving towards that common goal ensuring that we actually have um, that common area and working towards that is how we unite as a movement um, and respond in a single um, manner is so important. Um, and that's kind of a lot of our work. Uh, we said students often feel powerless, oftentimes because they're the ones that are maybe one student representative or um, you're the youngest person in the room and often can feel quite um, difficult to raise issues and raise your voice. So ensuring you have the ability and empowered to do that is so, so important. Um, so as a mass movement, we have that ability to create change um, and see movement. So that's from our group. Thank you so much, Marie. Uh, I would just like to ask for the next reporting group uh, to talk slower, if possible, because we have we're having the simultaneous translation, so we can facilitate a little bit the understanding here. And I would also like to call uh, the parallel tree. Hello, uh, my name is Gary Tobin. Uh, thank you all very much for having me here, and I am also uh, with the Union of Students. Uh, in Ireland, and I was part of Group 3. Um, so we were looking at the past um, and lessons we can take into the future, and we had a number of questions for this. So question uh, one was, what can we learn from the past as students? Uh, so we talked um, a lot about the importance of determination and never giving up, and how it's um, a lot more important uh, to be interconnected because in the past um, we did not have the same technology uh, as we do have today and we did not have the same capacity uh, and systems um, for interacting with each other and gathering information uh, and collaborating uh, as, as a big community so going forward those are all really big important factors and I suppose today's event is a really good example um, of, of that as well. Um, we also looked at how in the past uh, there was a, probably a little bit more of a narrow uh, view on education um, and how there may have been a misconception that education was all about just getting the degree and preparing you for the world ahead. 
Um, but we think going forward, and what we've learned about this is that education is not just about um, educating yourself, but, but educating yourself to interpret the world differently, uh, to question everything that is done, to question the systems that are there, and to really uh, be a critical thinker and look at how we can change uh, the world around us in crafting uh, the kind of future we would like to see for ourselves uh, and for future generations. Um, so we said critical thinking was very important in that regard. And we also said more recently that the global pandemic, uh, which, which hit us this year, um, shows a great um, example of just how quick governments and society uh, can mobilize and can react to things uh, and make change and make uh, cultural shifts uh, when we need to. And if we can take that and apply the same pressure and collaborate uh, together as, as a community um, in education as well and in our institutions, that is something to really bring going forward. Uh, the next question that was asked is what are the best practices we can implement right now to not lose uh, momentum. Uh, so we said that collective action is the way forward and everyone uh, moving together. Uh, it is important that we are breaking out of our silos um, and that people are making use of these opportunities uh, to come together and uh, to collaborate. And I suppose drawing from um, different examples as well, um, they were also saying uh, youth is very important uh, and it's very important that uh, young voices come together um, as well, that these are the forces um, of change. And we drew from quite a lot of different um, examples in environmental movements or, or initiatives bringing together many different youth organisations um, to also engage with uh, institutions and engage with people on, on different platforms. And that goes for a global platform but it also goes for an international uh, platform and, and a local platform to make sure there's collective action, uh, create a uh, collective struggle um, and, and, and active um, activism uh, in, in tackling uh, these issues. And it was also highlighted that uh, it's really important that when we are coming up with activism and we're coming up with these ideas, that we make sure we have continuity, that we make sure um, we have a permanent strategy uh, going forward and that we make sure that when we are taking action for something that we don't just stop there, that we make sure we come up with a plan, that we present the plan and that uh, we make sure there's just still a driving force that it doesn't, that we don't loosen our grip on these things. Uh, we talked as well a lot about how science-based actions um, are, are important and should underlie a lot of it. Um, and that, yeah, just the importance of taking action across societies collectively at once. Um, we also said there was a need for quality education and sustainability in schools. Um, that um, with, 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 with a few exceptions, uh, society, yeah, with the case of a few exceptions, um, society as a whole has not really looked at how we can bring sustainability and climate action and all of that into our educational systems. Uh, which would provide the youth um, with the tools it needs um, and the sense of, I suppose, self-efficacy uh, in tackling these problems, in raising these questions, um, in challenging the uh, patriarchal society um, and make sure we can just ele elevate um, the voices of young people, uh, reaching out to more marginalised groups as well, particularly uh, indigenous groups um, as, as well is really important. Um, as, as well as uh, placing particular emphasis when it comes to education um, on, on making sure it, it, it's challenging those kind of gender inequalities um, as, as well. Um, and just, I suppose, the, the need for students and young people to have proper ownership um, of, of, of these things as well, uh, of these initiatives uh, in, in tackling them. Um, the next question we asked was, what are the decision making spaces? Uh, to make our voices heard. I kind of touched on this um, earlier, but there was, um, it was said that this is a very crucial point and um, that we make sure we have uh, people included in formal spaces and informal spaces and um, that we look at the different levels this can happen in, 
which was the, that kind of local um, and international and global spaces. And we said it was very important um, that uh, people were educated as well, just on the institutions and how they work so that we can uh, ensure that we are part of the change uh, that is happening. Uh, and again, it was raised that we do take collective action um, and that we align ourselves um, with those global platforms and tackling those goals. Um, lots of different examples were also put out there as well, such as uh, COP26 in Glasgow, Glasgow uh, and Milan, UNESCO, and maybe those engaging with SDGs, uh, and as well as the G7 and uh, G12, just examples of different platforms or, or organizations or initiatives uh, that people could, could get involved in as well. Um, and let me just see now. Yeah, and it was just noted that these platforms can be very hyper complex um, and that we make sure we equipped young people with the proper tools to be involved in those processes. And the very last question we asked was, what was the message of encouragement to uh, participants? Uh, why, why should we keep going? And it was very simply put that um, because it is about our future, uh, it is not negotiable. Uh, it's really important that we're all in this together because this is something that uh, affects all of us together. Um, and just the uh, importance of being interconnected and uh, that we all support each other in these ways. Uh, it was also said that it is good to look at just how much we have achieved in such a short space of time uh, that there's been up that there's been absolutely brilliant um things that we've been able to do so far but there is still so much more work to do um, and i suppose it's just important that we don't just look at the negatives we look at the positives that have been achieved uh, so far and use that as a real driving force uh, going forward um, and the last thing that was just said is that we need to always be solution uh, orientated uh, and to always keep the momentum uh, going and to make sure we support each other. And that was us. Thank you so much, Gary. I would like to thank Gary and everyone here for bringing such great contributions to our summit. And I would like to call Ankit for the conclusion of our summit today. All right. So we've made it to the end. Thank you, everybody who stuck around. Um, and this was the first ever worldwide student summit on climate action and biodiversity. And I'm so proud that we made it this far, two and a half hours of such intense and great conversations. It was a privilege to be here. And thank you to everybody who joined us today. The success of this event lies in everybody who attends it with the, because the goals of this uh, summit were to build this collaboration, the collaboration between the student movement and the youth and student-led climate action and biodiversity groups, because we've been working alongside each other forever. And this we're hoping is the start to the formal part, uh, a formal agreement to work together, organize together and get a lot of these victories going forward. I think when we started this process a few months ago, it was, um, it, we, we weren't sure how successful this would be, but I'm so proud to say that this was epic. We pulled it off. We had over a hundred people come along. And I think this only show, this is only the beginning of the huge success that we can expect from this movement going forward. I'll keep it short considering we only have one more minute to go. I'll pass this over to Giuseppe real quick for a picture. Uh, so if you're comfortable with taking a picture with us, um, feel free to turn on your cameras and uh, Giuseppe, uh, over to you, and then I'll take that back later. Okay, so I, I will ask you to stay for a bit longer than usual because I have to take three screenshots and I'm also really bad at doing this thing. So please smile and switch on your cameras, of course. Just a second again, sorry. Uh. So we're only smiling now, no one was smiling before. Yeah, continue smiling, please. Taking the second.
but he was crying all the way through. No, I hope not. <laughs> You are you're trolling Giuseppe. <laughs> He's just gonna hold us here forever. <laughs> Keep smiling until your cheeks bleed. It's the punishment. <laughs> La last opportunity to smile, dears. I think it's it's done. Going once, going twice, and click. Okay, done. Sweet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Giuseppe. And finally, thanks so much to the organizing team. We've had a fantastic group of people working with us. Um, here from the GSF steering committee, we had uh, Carmen, we had Giuseppe, we had Amilcar, we had our fantastic executive director, Sebastian, who's been holding up the fort at the back end. Even though he wasn't visible a whole lot, we owe a lot of our thanks to him. We also had Bianca doing the ending for us. And if I missed, uh, oh, and we had Julian from Gibbon doing a lot of the work, uh, uh, a lot of the uh, work connecting a lot of our environmental friends with us here today. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the interpreters. Thank you for two hours of intense interpretation, especially the Irish speak real fast. And I hope that bit was all right for y'all. <laughs> Everybody, I have to say, uh, the interpreters do a fantastic job. And uh, finally, um, I'd like to thank our organizing partners, uh, namely the uh, Global Student Forum and our members, our member organizations, the All Africa Students uh, Union, the Commonwealth Students Association, the European Students Union, Organizing Bureau of uh, School Students Unions, and the Organization of Continental Latin American and Caribbean Students. Uh, that's my understanding of what's in uh, some Spanish. Also, the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, the Students Organizing for Sustainability International, Commonwealth Youth Climate Change Organization, and the Future Coalition. That's been, uh, that's been everything. Thank you so much for coming out here today. And I look forward to seeing you folks at the next actions. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.